All right, good morning. Let me move my mic up just a little bit, if I can. All right, well, I hope everybody had a nice weekend. We actually have a short week this week, um, just three days of class, which is short for us. Um, the plan for this week is to get through chapter three. We might get started on chapter four. Um, so we're moving right along, and so we'll just keep on going. Um, if you were not here last Thursday, you probably didn't get a periodic table that I handed out. Does anybody need one? A few left. There you go, one in the back. There you go. So the reason why I handed this particular one out, this is the one that I will put um, on the exams. So this is kind of your chance to get familiar with the layout of this particular table. I mean, they're all very similar, but where they put the atomic number and the average atomic mass and different things um, does vary between periodic tables. So get used to this one. Uh, the attendance sheet is going around the room. Um, we'll only do one pre-lecture assignment for this week, and that will be due tomorrow. I will post it as soon as I can this morning, okay? Again, I try to keep these short. They shouldn't take too much time. Um, homework two is posted um, as normal. You got an extra day this weekend because of the holiday, but generally homework will be due Saturday. I will get quiz number two up today. Um, a few people have started homework number two, but not very many yet, which is understandable. Don't forget about office hours. You do get one bonus point for every office hour attendance up to 10 points. And 10 points is, will add up to 1% of your grade. So you can raise your grade by 1%. Might not sound like a lot, but it could make the difference. So take advantage of that. If you don't mix these chemicals correctly, It could be a catastrophe. Oh, come on. It's not Monday, it's Tuesday. You guys should be in a better mood. No, it feels like Monday, doesn't it? All right. All right, any questions before we start? We're kind of now into the third week. Hopefully you got the feel for how everything's going. Everything, everything's good for everybody? All right. So just to remind you, it, it always feels like we haven't seen each other for a while. And this is actually an extra day than normal. But from Thursday to Monday, a little bit of a gap. We had started talking about um, the theory behind the atom. We went back to some kind of very early experiments with Lavoisier and others. Uh, and then we kind of wrapped up toward the end with Dalton, who kind of pulled a lot of things together into his atomic theory. And just to kind of sum up, um, atoms of one element are different from atoms of another element. They are, they are unique, and we'll talk about why that is today. Atoms do combine to form compounds they will combine in some whole number ratio. And in chemical reactions, as opposed to nuclear reactions, um, we may, if we have time at the end of the semester, just spend a day on nuclear reactions just for fun. Um, those do involve the nucleus, and one atom is changed into a different atom, depending on the nuclear reaction. But in a chemical reaction, which is the focus of most chemistry, um, atoms are not created or destroyed. Okay, so when you look at a chemical reaction, even though things will change how they're connected, we still have the same number and types of atoms on one side of the reaction as we do on the other. And one thing that Dalton did not get right he did say that atoms were the smallest indivisible particle of matter. Okay, there's another thing he didn't get right, but he just didn't know about it. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Um, 
he did not know about subatomic particles. So that's what we're going to spend the bulk of today on. Um, we're just going, we're not going to go totally into the weeds on subatomic particles, but we will talk about protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, a couple of things to <clears throat> talk about before we start talking about protons, neutrons, and electrons and the discovery of those things. Atoms are really small. Okay, as you probably have a visual or at least some type of knowledge about. So we're going to talk about, at least initially, the mass of an atom in atomic mass units. Okay? And the symbol, let me get a pen here. The symbol for atomic mass unit used to be AMU, atomic mass unit, AMU. Now it's typically just abbreviated U for atomic mass unit. And as you can see there, and I kind of drew a circle through it, but it is a very small mass, 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Um, we'll also write this in grams, 10 to the negative 24th grams. Okay, you don't have to memorize that, but what I want you to see that is a really, really small mass. So when we start saying the um, atomic mass of carbon-12 is 12 AMUs, okay, well, it's 12 times that number. That's a mass of one carbon atom. So it's a very, very small mass. Hydrogen is the smallest atom. It has an atomic mass of about one AMU. All right. Um, as we start talking about protons and electrons, you know that protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged, and just to make sure that we know this, which I'm sure you do, opposite charges attract, and like charges repel. Okay. All right, so let's start getting into um, the discovery of electrons and then the nucleus. Um, the discovery of the electron really kind of starts about 1800, although Volta didn't know for sure, but Volta invents the battery, okay, back in 1800. So that's pretty cool. So batteries involve the flow of electrons, okay? And that was, so you've probably, you know, and then so, of course, we, we still would call these electrochemical cells, we call them voltaic cells at times. That terminology is still used. Um, this slide doesn't quite fit here, but it just this is just kind of to show you um, we can do the opposite of a battery. So battery is spontaneous, okay? Runs on its own, produces electricity. We can actually go the opposite direction and use electrons to do reactions. So this is actually called electrolysis. Um, where we, in this case, are breaking the bonds of water and producing hydrogen and oxygen gas. So that's kind of the opposite of what, I mean, using a battery, but uh, forcing a non-spontaneous reaction to happen. All right, so let's start getting into atomic structure. Um, we've talked about the periodic table. Um, I've read a little bit of chemical history, just kind of for fun. And um, this was, I think, Mendeleev's second published periodic table. They got better over time. Um, this one looks kind of like our current one. It looks fairly similar. Um, he tended to, I think they've kind of rotated this. He tended to have them, the tables kind of going the other direction. But he uh, organized the periodic table pretty early in time. All right, so this is going to be the main focus of today's lecture. How do we know about electrons? How do we know about the nucleus? And then we'll, we'll look at counting protons, neutrons, and electrons, that kind of thing. So this is about 1897. Okay, the concept of the electron has already been proposed. Um, they were initially called electrines or electrines. Um, but it wasn't really known at that point that they were fundamental 
particle of all matter until this guy. And this is J.J. Thompson. He's a British chemist. And he invents what's called the cathode ray tube. All right, and so he had a metal disc at one end of this tube. So or actually has metal at both ends. Okay, but there's the cathode end. He passes a high voltage between those and a beam of some sort, which you can't see, flows between those two pieces of metal. If you put a um, phosphorescent background, he could then see these cathode rays. Okay, and so let's actually, while we're here, I'm gonna jump out of here if it'll let me. All right, let me see where my volume is here. That's good. Let's watch this. A cathode ray tube is the forerunner. Sorry. This is just mute, right? Which most of the air has been. A cathode ray tube is the forerunner of the television tube. It is a glass tube from which most of the air has been evacuated. When the tube... So when it says television tube, that's old school television. Okay? I finally got rid of my last old school TV. My wife made me get rid of it. It still worked great. I have, I have, some, I have some nice TVs too, but I had this one that I bought like in 1995, and it was, for the time, it was spectacular. Of course, in today's standards, it really sucks. But, um, and it weighs 150 pounds, and it was just, you know, monstrosity. And I finally had to give it up. But old school cathode ray tube TVs. Two metal plates are connected to a high voltage source. The negatively charged plate, called the cathode, emits an invisible ray. The cathode ray is drawn to the positively charged plate, called the anode, where it passes through a hole and continues traveling to the other end of the tube. When the ray strikes the specially coated surface, the cathode ray produces a strong fluorescence or bright light. Okay. So one cool thing about this is that um, Thompson tried 20 different metals as a cathode. 20 different metals. Okay, so we're experimenting, right? So he tries one metal, he gets these cathode rays. Oh, let's try another metal. Same thing. Try another one. 20 different metals. Okay. So then his conclusion is that, well, this must be a fundamental particle of all matter. Okay, if he couldn't do every single element, but he did enough that he could kind of conclude that this must exist in all matter. When an electric field is applied across the cathode ray tube, the cathode ray is attracted by the plate bearing positive charges. Therefore, a cathode ray must consist of negatively charged particles. Okay. So there's a further step in his experimental thought process, right? He's like, oh, well, let's see if we can see what charge these are. Very easy. Um, put, you know, uh, electric field across, attracted to the positive electrode. L opposite charges attract. These must be negatively charged particles. We know these negatively charged particles as electrons. A moving charge body behaves like a tiny magnet and it can interact with an external magnetic field. The electrons are deflected by the magnetic field. As expected, when the direction of the external magnetic field is reversed, the beam of electrons is deflected in the opposite direction. A cathode ray tube is the forerunner of the television tube. It is a glass tube from which most of the air has been evacuated. I must have hit something, but... Just to the electric field so that the electrostatic deflection... Okay, so, sorry about that. Um, so he did electric field, magnetic field, then he says, well, let's put the two of them together. Okay, see what, see what happens. Let me just back up a little bit. ...field so that the electrostatic deflection, theta E, was the same as the magnetic deflection, theta B, and was able to calculate the charge-to-mass ratio of an electron using the following equation. Where E is the applied electric field, theta is the angle of deflection, B is the applied magnetic field, 
and L is the distance traveled by the cathode rays. Thomson determined the charge to mass ratio of an electron to be negative 1.76 times 10 to the 8th coulombs per gram. Okay, so let's unpack some of that. There's a lot of stuff there, okay? <clears throat> you don't know, have to know every detail about these experiments, but what I want you to know are the important findings, right? So this idea of a negatively charged particle had already been out there. Okay, but Thomson really proved that electrons exist in all matter. Okay, so you might want to write this down. Electrons exist in all matter. Okay, he tried 20 different metals and got the same thing. Okay, so that's one thing. Electrons exist in all matter. He confirmed that they were negatively charged by applying an electric field to deflect the cathode rays. Okay, so electrons exist in all matter. They're negatively charged. And then this is the last piece. Okay, you don't have to memorize this number, but we're going to use this in just a little bit, this charge-to-mass ratio of an electron. Okay, so electrons exist in all matter. They're negatively charged. Charge-to-mass ratio. Those are kind of the big things from this experiment. Okay, any questions? Do you think this is a cool experiment? This is 1897. And this kind of, you know, one thing I think that, you know, one, I mean, this was important stuff, right? You know, we take it for granted. Oh, yeah, we know there are electrons. We know they're negatively charged. But this was really the defining experiment, okay? And just to look at kind of his thought process, he tried many different metals as a cathode. That's pretty cool. He's like, well, let me see. Let's see what an electric field does. Let's see what a magnetic field does. Let's see what happens when I balance those two fields. Let's see what I can figure out. Okay, and this is the charge to mass ratio is what he was able to figure out there. So that's a really, I think, a, a defining experiment. Let's just go back to the notes. So you have some slides that kind of um, hint at this experiment. This is from a different book. Um, there's Thompson in his lab with his cathode ray tube. Again, it's great what you can find out on the interwebs. Um, so again, there's the experiment. Here's a um, representation on the right of his um, initial kind of cathode ray tube. Here's, again, using an applied electric field. And this was at opposite to what the animation showed. But again, these particles are attracted to the positive plate of the electric field. They must be negatively charged. Okay, so electron is a tiny negatively charged particle. And then Thompson goes further. Okay, he says, well, let me propose a model of the atom. Okay, now he's an English chemist. I guess plum pudding's popular in England. I've never had plum pudding. At least the picture they show here, it looks more like a muffin than what I think of as pudding. Um, but he knows there must be a positive charge to counterbalance the negative charge because atoms are neutral. He knows that. Okay. So this is his proposal. Well, there must be negative electrons. There must be something positive to counterbalance that to make the atom neutral. And so his thought was, well, maybe there's just kind of this diffuse positive charge. OK, think kind of like a cloud of positive charge. And the electrons are embedded in that somehow. OK. So spread out positive charge. Electrons are embedded like raisins in plum pudding. I guess that's plum pudding. I have no idea. Has anybody ever had plum pudding? Does anybody care? Anyway, but this was called the plum pudding model of the atom. This was kind of one of the first, maybe the first, proposed structures of the atom where you have spread out positive charge. Electrons are somehow embedded in that positive charge. Here's a different picture from another book to try to give a, maybe a better feel for what the plum pudding model was proposed to be. 
that kind of pinkish, reddish, whatever color that is, is the spread out positive charge. And then these kind of yellow spheres represent the electrons that are somehow embedded in that positive charge. Okay. So again, this is late 1800s, early 1900s, quite a while ago. This is really our first model of the atom. All right. Any questions so far? Yes. Yeah. Coulomb is the fundamental unit unit of charge. Okay, it's just, you know, it's in I'm trying to think um, what would we use in the English system? Not sure, but that's just kind of the fundamental unit of charge. Okay, well you don't worry about it. It's not like we really need to um, know what what that correlates to, but it, we will use that with another experiment to figure out something else about the electron. Okay, so where were we? Okay, so here's the plum pudding model. Let's do another experiment that tells us a little bit more about electrons. Okay, actually quite a bit more about electrons. This is a really cool experiment. Guy up at the top, his name's Robert Milliken. He, I he's from the US, I believe he was at the University of Chicago. And here's his experiment. So this is just obviously um, a schematic of it, but he had this chamber that he built. Okay, um, It was a chamber that you could evacuate, you could get it to um, pretty low pressure. And what he would do is he would um, shoot in a mist of oil. Okay, He would then hit the air molecules. There were still some, even though you evacuate that, there's still air inside there. He would hit some of those air molecules with x-rays, and it would eject electrons from the air molecules. Okay? So you probably know x-rays are pretty powerful electromagnetic radiation, if you've ever had an x-ray before. Um, and so they're powerful enough they can eject electrons from atoms. Those electrons then adhere to the oil droplets. So these oil droplets now have a charge. Okay. They drop down through a hole, and then he can do some experiments with this. And so let's actually go to an animation that'll give you a better feel for this. Let me turn, I think the volume's still too loud. Let's try this. In a series of experiments carried out between 1908 and 1917, R.A. Milliken succeeded in measuring the charge of the electron with great precision. In his experiment, a fine mist of oil was sprayed into the upper chamber with an atomizer. Some of the tiny oil droplets fell through the hole in the upper floor, and Milliken was able to determine the mass of an oil drop from its terminal velocity. Next, Milliken used an X-ray source to ionize gas molecules in the chamber. Electrons from this ionization process adhered to the oil droplets. The oil droplets now carry a negative charge. The negatively charged oil droplets can be halted by adjusting the voltage across the two plates. As the voltage across the plates is increased, the velocity of the oil drops slows. As the voltage is increased further, some drops will begin to move upward toward the positive plate. If the voltage is set just right, an oil drop can be suspended. Okay. So that's pretty cool, right? So not only is he, you know, spraying in a fine mist of oil, he's ionizing um, air molecules in the chamber. Those electrons that come off those molecules adhere to these droplets. He now applies an electric field. He can essentially suspend an oil droplet in midair. That's pretty cool. But it gets better. When an oil drop is suspended, its weight, mass times acceleration due to gravity, is exactly counterbalanced by the electric force applied. The electric force applied equals the applied electric field, E, times the charge on the drop, Q. Since the mass of the oil drop, the acceleration due to gravity, and the applied electric field are known, Millikan could solve for Q, which is the charge on the drop. Okay, again, you don't have to know all these details. Um, it's actually a little bit more complicated because he had to deal with, um, you know, kind of air, air turbulence and other things even inside that evacuated chamber. 
but um, he was able to figure out the charge on a drop. Now, what's interesting is some of the drops had more than one electron attached to them. Okay, some of them might have three electrons attached or four, but we'll see how he dealt with that. Milliken found that droplets had different charges, but each was a whole number multiple of a smaller charge, equal to negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Okay, so maybe some, some of the drops were two times that charge. Okay, or some of the drops were three times that charge, or some of the drops were four times, whatever. But he said, oh, but every drop was some multiple of that smaller charge. That must be the charge of an electron. Okay, so this is the charge of an electron. Millikan concluded that this was the fundamental unit of charge, the charge of an electron. From the charge of an electron and the charge to mass ratio of an electron determined by Thomson using a cathode ray tube, Millikan was able to calculate the mass of an electron. Okay, so now we go back. So, of course, Millikan, you know, any good scientist is going to know the literature, going to know what's been published. And, of course, that would have been um, Thompson's discovery of the charge to mass ratio would have been a huge discovery. So he now know Millikan now knows the charge of the electron. Thompson figured out the charge to mass ratio. Look, it's just a unit conversion, right? It's just one step unit conversion, arrange the charge to mass ratio correctly so that Coulomb's cancel. Look, we can do some math. We end up with mass, it's pretty cool. And now we know the mass of an electron. Can we weigh this out? Can we weigh out that mass? No. Right, we don't have a balance that can weigh out 10 to the negative 28th grams, but he can, from this calculation, um, figure out the fundamental unit of charge. The mass of an electron, 9.10 times 10 to the negative 28th grams, is an exceedingly small mass. Okay. And Millikan was actually really close. We do know the charge of an electron more precisely now. We do know the mass of an electron more precisely now, but Millikan was awfully darn close, okay? So I, kind, I hope you kind of see the, the excitement of these experiments and how cool they were. Um, because, I mean, this is just fundamental stuff, and this is all 100 plus years ago, all right? So what did Millikan tell us? He told us, he determined the charge of an electron, the actual numerical charge. Okay, we knew electrons were negatively charged, but Millikan goes one step further, the actual numerical charge of an electron, and he determined the mass of an electron. Those are huge. The numerical charge and the mass of an electron. All right, have we had enough experiments yet? All right, hang with me for one more. So Rutherford, okay? Rutherford actually um, was a postdoctoral student who worked for Thompson. <clears throat> okay, so postdoctoral means you've already gotten your PhD, and I think uh, Rutherford's PhD was actually in physics. Um, he had already gotten his doctorate degree now he's doing postdoctoral studies with Thompson. And so he's working in Thompson's lab. He thinks the plum pudding model is, you know, he goes along with that. He thinks that's fine. And he's going to prove that the plum pudding model is correct. So he designs another really neat experiment. Um, really early days of radioactive stuff. Okay, so he uses a radioactive source that emits what are called alpha particles. Don't worry about what those are, but they're posit positively charged. We'll talk about radioactivity in a little bit, but they're positively charged. They're traveling at high velocity. They're very small particles, okay? He believes that the plum pudding model is right with this diffuse positive charge, and you're shooting positively charged particles that are moving very fast, think like thousands of miles an hour. They're just gonna go right through. Okay, because remember, electrons are spread out. He thinks in this diffuse charge, positive charge, these positively charged particles should just zip right through 
this very, very thin gold foil. Okay, very, very thin gold foil. Okay, and it turns out that most of them do. This is actually not a very good representation of the experiment. The grad student and the undergrad who did most this work, um, one was named Marsden. What was the other one's name? Can't remember. Um, they would sit with, and I'm going to show you another picture. They would sit and they basically had a little viewing scope into this chamber. And they would sit there and watch and count flashes. Because every time a particle hit this fluorescent screen, it would send out a flash of light. And they would count. They would have to count about 8,000 flashes that went straight through before one would deflect. Would you like to do that? Sitting there staring through, counting flashes of light. 8,000 go straight through, one deflects. 8,000 go straight through, another deflects. Okay. Poor, poor students, right? Okay. And some of them end, end up pretty much coming almost straight back. Okay. So this is actually a mock-up of the experimental. It's cut away on the side. This was a sealed chamber. But there's the microscope going in that you would sit there and stare through for hours and hours and hours. And it's kind of hard to see the alpha source. But then the whole inside of that is coated with zinc sulfide so that when these particles hit that zinc sulfide, you'll see a flash of light. All right, let me see if we should uh, watch one more animation, if you guys can hang with me. Where did it go? In the early 1900s, J.J. Thompson proposed that an atom was a uniform sphere of positively charged matter in which electrons were embedded. This model is sometimes called the plum pudding model. Electrons are embedded in a sphere of positive matter similar to raisins in plum pudding. In 1910, Ernest Rutherford, Hans Geiger, and Ernest Marsden carried out experiments in which very thin foils of metal were used as targets for alpha particles emitted from a radioactive source. Click on what Rutherford expected to observe, the results Rutherford expected based on Thompson's Sorry. model of the atom. So anyway, the other, the other student was Geiger, of Geiger counter fame. So if you've ever heard of a Geiger counter for measuring radioactivity, he was the other student involved with the experiment. So there's the plum pudding model. Rutherford expected the alpha particles to just go straight through. Based on Thompson's model, Rutherford expected that the positively charged alpha particles should pass through the uniform sphere of positively charged matter with little or no deflection. Click on actual experimental results to see what actually happens. Rutherford observed that the majority of alpha particles penetrated the foil either undeflected or with only a slight deflection. Every now and then, however, an alpha particle was scattered or deflected at a large angle. In some instances, an alpha particle actually bounced back in the direction from which it had come. This was a most surprising finding, for in Thompson's model, the positive charge of the atom was so diffuse, or spread out, that the positive alpha particles were expected to pass through the foil with very little deflection. Upon making this discovery, Rutherford exclaimed, it was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. Click on Rutherford's model to see the model of the atom that Rutherford proposed based on his experimental observations. Okay, so that, that quote, 15-inch shell, what kind of shell is he referring to? Yes. Yeah, it's like an artillery shell. So this is, this is kind of pre-World War I. So what Rutherford was saying is you shoot an artillery shell at a piece of tissue paper, and it comes back and hits you. That's how surprised he was by the fact that these alpha particles, some of them, some of them bounce straight back. Okay. And because of that, he proposes this. Based on the results of his experiment, Rutherford postulated a nuclear atom. 
All of the positive charge and most of the mass of the atom is concentrated in a very small volume called the nucleus. Electrons occupy the remaining space of the atom. The radius of an atom is approximately 20,000 times larger than the radius of the nucleus. Most of the positively charged alpha particles pass straight through the diffuse electron clouds of the atoms. Some alpha particles pass close to the small positive nuclei and are deflected at large angles. A few particles score a direct hit on the nuclei and come almost straight back. Okay. Now, this is not even close to scale of how big the nucleus is compared to where the electrons are. So we're going to look at an image in just a minute to try to give you a better feel for how tiny the nucleus is relative to the sphere of electrons, or what we call the electron cloud. So when we say electron cloud, remember electrons are in constant motion. Okay, So not all that space shown in green is occupied by electrons at all times, but that's Essentially, if we were to contain where the electrons are moving, most of that, most of the electrons would be inside that sphere that we represent by this electron cloud. All right, well, thanks for hanging with me. I, I think those experiments are so cool. Um, and I think it gives, gives a good basis for our understanding of the atom. So you might say, oh, I already know all that, but now you know all these discoveries that happened 100 plus years ago. So this is Rutherford's conclusion. Um, the atom is mostly empty space, okay? The atom is mostly empty space. So what's shown in yellow in this image, you know, electrons are constantly moving through that space, but um, electrons are really tiny. So at any given moment in time, there's nothing there. And that's just a representation of the region of space that the electrons are moving in. The nucleus is very small and very dense. Most of the mass of the atom is in the nucleus. Most of the mass of the atom is in the nucleus. OK, so we already looked at this. So most of the alpha particles will go straight through. Some will deflect indicating this small, dense, positively charged nucleus. And it is kind of interesting. Rutherford didn't know for sure that the nucleus was positively charged. He, it was later that experimental evidence came to show that the nucleus was positive and the, elec you know, the electrons were moving about. Um, but that was what he kind of proposed, that the nucleus was positive with electrons moving about. All right, so here's our model of the atom. Um, neutrons came later. Neutrons came later. Um, they were harder to discover because they didn't have a charge. The charged particles are easier to um, find. But protons and neutrons in the nucleus. Oh, got to get a pen here. And the electrons are moving about the nucleus. Okay. We'll talk more about the electrons and the models that describe their motion in a little bit. And this is to give you a, a better example of the relative volume of the nucleus relative to the volume that the electrons are moving throughout. So uh, assume that there is a mosquito somewhere in the middle of that football stadium. That mosquito represents the size of the nucleus. Okay, so the mosquito itself is a nucleus. The volume of the stadium is the volume that the electrons are moving throughout. Okay, so just kind of think about that to get a feel for the size of the nucleus relative to where the electrons are. All right, so there's our nucleus, protons and neutrons. The mass of a proton in atomic mass units is about one. Okay, so remember that atomic mass unit we started with, it's 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24th grams. Again, you don't have to memorize that, 
but just make sure you know that an atomic mass unit is a really small mass. Okay, so we will say a proton has a unit charge of one. It's kind of nice. We're just going to round that to one because it's about one AMU. Okay, we're also going to say it has a unit charge of one. Okay, but the charge is actually the opposite of an electron. Oops, sorry. Let me erase that. That's C for Coulomb, okay? Again, you don't have to memorize that number, but the electron is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th Coulombs. The proton is positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, okay? But we'll just say fundamental charge plus one, just to make it simple, okay? Mass of a neutron is almost the same as the mass of a proton, a little bit more, okay, a little bit more. Um, but again, we'll say it has a, a mass of one AMU, okay, just um, make things easier. No charge of the neutron. There's our electron cloud, electrons moving about the nucleus opposite charge of a proton, and look at the mass of an electron. Okay, so the electron does have mass. Okay, don't think that the electron does not, but it's much mass less massive than a proton or a neutron, and this is just a, a it's actually not exactly this. Okay, so the electron mass is about one two thousandth the mass of a proton or a neutron. Okay, so just to let you know, a proton, we symbolize P, that's nice, neutron N, electron E. Wow, okay, but we will use those symbols. All right, let's see if we can get actually to a few things where you get to do a little work here. All right, so think about Dalton. Right? Think about Dalton. Dalton um, said every uh, atoms of one element are different from atoms of another element. Well, what is it that defines an atom? And it's actually the number of protons that defines an atom. So if you look at a, a periodic table, the peri our current periodic table is arranged by atomic number. Okay? You'll start with hydrogen, which has an atomic number of one, Helium's two, lithium's three, beryllium's four, and so on. Okay. Mendeleev actually arranged the periodic table by mass, which almost works, and we'll talk about a few exceptions at some point. Okay. So that number, which is in the top left of this periodic table, that's the number of protons. That's the atomic number. So if we pick, you know, some random element. Um, one of my favorite elements, I really like titanium. So it's element 22. Okay, it's in the fourth row. So you see the row labeled four. You'll see a 22. Every titanium atom has 22 protons. Okay, doesn't matter. We're gonna talk about something called isotopes. We're gonna talk about ions. It doesn't matter. If it's titanium, it has 22 protons. That's what defines our atom, okay? And I kind of just mentioned these as we went, went along. Hydrogen atomic number one, every hydrogen atom, one proton. Every helium atom, two protons. Every lithium atom, four, three protons. And beryllium would be four. Okay. Now, a couple, couple of things here that are important. Um, atoms are neutral. Okay, we're going to talk about ions forming positive ions and negative ions and how that happens. Probably not today. We only have about six minutes left. But atoms on their own are neutral, so the number of electrons must equal the number of protons. That's nice and simple, right? 
So if you look at hydrogen with one proton as a neutral atom, it must have one electron. Um, take sodium with 11 protons, must have 11 electrons for that neutral atom. That's kind of nice. All right, now, what's, what makes up most of the mass of the atom? What two particles? Yes? That would be it. So protons and neutrons make up most of the mass of the atom. So we have to sum together protons and neutrons to get the mass. Now remember, electrons do have mass, but they contribute so little that it's not going to affect our calculation in any great way, because most of the mass is in the nucleus, protons and neutrons. All right, so let's, hopefully we'll get to do a few things here, so you don't have to sit and listen to me for the entire time. One thing that Dalton did not know about was isotopes. Okay, he said every atom of a particular element was identical. Everybody hear that? Okay, every atom of a given element was different than other elements, but every atom of a given element was identical. Okay, not quite right. Okay, they have the same chemical properties, but they're, they're going to be different because, as you can see here, here are the three isotopes of hydrogen. Three isotopes of hydrogen. Protium, which is the most common isotope. We'll talk more about percent abundance and whatnot. Deuterium is another isotope of hydrogen, and tritium is a third isotope of hydrogen. Tritium happens to be radioactive. Um, so what's the difference? What's the difference? Number of neutrons. So remember, it's the protons that identify the element. So one proton, hydrogen. Okay? Each of those only has one proton. The neutrons do not define the element. So protium, which is the most common isotope of hydrogen, doesn't have any neutrons. Deuterium has one neutron. Tritium has two neutrons. Okay? Same atomic number, different mass number. Okay? So let's, before we go to something else, let's write some stuff out here. I didn't write that in the right place, but it's close enough. That goes here. So what am I representing there? What's the bottom number? What's the subscript? Yes. It's the number of protons. So that bottom number is my atomic number, my number of protons. So this bottom number we call the atomic number. And what's the top number? Okay, and that is protons plus neutrons. Because remember, it's protons and neutrons that make up the bulk of the mass of the atom. So mass number for protium is just one. It has one proton. Mass number of deuterium is two, one proton, one neutron. And mass number of tritium is three, one proton, two neutrons. Okay. In our last couple minutes, let's uh, do one more thing here. Let me, I wish I had more space. Let's go to the next slide. I'll just write it on this one. Um, So those are three isotopes of carbon. In our last minute, tell me how many protons and neutrons are in each one of those. You may want to look at a periodic table. Okay, so I hear, I hear people already saying numbers. Okay. So one thing to point out, I don't have to put the atomic number there. Okay, a lot of times you will see it there, but because I put the symbol of the element, the atomic number is not needed, right? Because I can just look at a periodic table, unless, you know, you know, over time you'll know some of these atomic numbers. 
But because carbon is there, I can look at my periodic table up in the top left there. I see six, so I can just write that in. And it would be the same for every isotope of carbon. Okay. So easy math, right? So this first one, six protons, six neutrons. Neutral atom, six electrons. Kind of symmetrical there, all right? Um, what about the second one? Carbon 13. How many neutrons? Seven. And then a neutral, six electrons. We'll talk about ions next time. And then six protons. How many neutrons? Eight. Eight. And then also six electrons for a neutral atom. Whew, that's a piece of cake. Okay? So we'll keep going. We'll actually, that was a lot of talking today, but we'll actually do more work in here tomorrow. Um, we'll actually get to ions, positive ions and negative ions. So what changes in an atom to get to a charged species? Um, we will do that in addition to some other things. So thanks for hanging with me. If you have any questions, come on down. Um, don't forget about office hours, get some free points. And watch for a pre-lecture coming up very soon. I'll send out an email once it's posted. Maybe, it'll, maybe the pre-lecture will get into ions, we'll see. Attendance sheet, did everybody get attendance before you leave? All right, cool. Hi.